this morning. If you would take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 4. We're going to pick up in verse 15 and hopefully make our way through the end of the chapter. As you find that place in your Bibles, I want you to think about the words you just sung, that His wounds have paid our ransom. It's a fact that until sin entered the world, there was no suffering. But from the moment that sin made its entrance, suffering has been a part of this existence. And as Peter writes to the church, he writes a lot about suffering because he knows that because of their faith relationship with God through the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that it is very likely and almost inevitable that suffering will be a part of their experience. And so here he will make a distinction between suffering for problematic behaviors and suffering for professing belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I want you to see with me what he has to say about that, picking up in verse 15. Again, he's writing to these, these folks in the early church, and he says, But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to Him in doing good as to a faithful Creator." Would you pray with me? Father, as we bow before you this morning and as we lend our minds to the process of trying to uncover the truths that are in your word and to help clarify and apply those to our lives, we ask for your help now. Lord, you know that, we've, that I've asked you over and over again this week to pour your spirit out as we gather here this morning, and I ask you again. Lord, pour Your Spirit out. Please help us sense the fullness of Your presence in this room. And Father, the, the truths that we will address this morning, and they're, they're serious and they're sobering in their declarations. And my prayer this morning is that, that there would not be one person who leaves here that has not obeyed the gospel of God. For we know and we'll see that to do that is a detriment that has eternal consequences. So Father, by Your grace, please speak to us in power this day. In Jesus' name, Amen. <clears throat> As Peter continues preparing and equipping these believers in the early church for the very real possibility that they might suffer because they confess to be followers of the Lord Jesus he, he deems it important to make the distinction that not all suffering is the same. And we've talked about that a little bit, but not at the extreme that he goes to here. We've talked about the fact that sometimes we suffer as a Christian, that that's part of the natural process of living, that everyone suffers at some point in some way. And then sometimes we might suffer because we're a Christian because of our confession of faith, because of our declaration of belief in the Lord Jesus, because we are uh, an avowed disciple of the Lord. We might suffer because of that. And there's a, there's a difference between suffering as a Christian, a Christian who suffers, and suffering because of your faith, because you're a Christian. But in this particular place, what Peter is going to do really involves a couple of things. The first thing that he's going to do is he's going to distinguish between suffering because one believes in Jesus and then suffering as a consequence of poor choices that are made in this life. 
And see, what he wants to do is to separate out those who suffer as a Christian or suffer because they're a Christian from those who suffer because they've made some choices and they've conducted themselves in a way that their behavior or their conduct results in evil cho- in, in suffering that comes into their life because of their poor choices. So he'll speak to both of these matters in these verses that we're opening up this morning. So I want to talk about this under the heading of definitive distinctions regarding the presence of suffering. And Peter clearly delineates various perspectives and then also various conclusions regarding suffering in this life. Now the first thing that he tells us here in verse 15, and I want to read that verse again just so you get a sense of where he's at. He says, let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Now, I don't think that Peter is really under the assumption that the believers that he's writing to would embrace these behaviors, at least not all of them, and and that they would expect to suffer as those who've committed these crimes or these sins or these evil acts. What I think Peter is saying here is that I don't want you as a believer who suffers to see your suffering in the same way as those who are suffering because of evil deeds and poor choices. So he's contrasting causes of suffering here. And he begins by telling us that there is an expected consequence of suffering that accompanies evil behavior. And he he says if, if you look at life and if you look at it practically and if you look at it with understanding and discernment, you will realize that there is suffering that comes as a a consequence of problematic conduct, of poor choices, of of wicked deeds, of evil behavior. There's suffering that will come because of not refraining from an evil life. And he mentions four behaviors here with differing degrees of impact. The first thing that he mentions is murdering. He says those who would commit murder can expect a consequence of suffering in their lives. There's a consequence that comes whenever someone commits this heinous act that is irreversible. First of all, there are those who lose their life on the other side of that, but then there's the one who has to live with whatever the consequence of that action brings. And so those who would would challenge somebody at the right that they might have to possess their own life by taking their life, he says there's a a natural repercussion that comes with that. There is a societal repercussion that comes with that. The natural repercussion is going to be a conscience that is weighted down with the guilt and the shame of the commitment of such a deed. The societal consequence will be the legal repercussion that might follow such a terrible, terrible act. Then he mentions those who would be a thief. And he says these are the people who violate another's right to possess their own property. And he says someone who comes in and steals from somebody else can expect a consequence of natural suffering that comes into their life. Again, there's a possibility of a legal repercussion. There's a possibility of of a societal repercussion that that results in legal ramifications. Then there's also the, the guilt of the conscience, the weight of the sin, the shame of living that kind of a lifestyle that comes in upon this person. Then he mentions an evildoer. And if you notice, these these. Deeds that he's talking about are successively less, it seems, in impact in some ways. To be malicious is someone who is, uh, to to be an evildoer is someone who has a malicious tone, a malicious tenor about themselves, someone who is troublesome or injurious or pernicious, someone who kind of just takes joy and pleasure in the, the, the bad situations and consequences and experiences of another and works to try to create those for them. And then he uses the idea of a busybody. Uh, I don't know if any of us have any clue what he's talking about here. We chuckle, don't we? Suddenly it gets real for us. We, we may not be a murderer, we may not be a thief, but sometimes we... And by the way, the word here, you need to understand the, the original language. It literally means someone who takes upon himself or herself the supervision of the life of another. Someone who takes upon themselves the supervision of the life of another. In other words, you think that you know better than whoever it is that you're trying to direct. 
And so this is someone who interjects themselves into the lives of other people with a desire or a design to control, to manipulate, to cause them to do what you think they ought to do or to be what you think they ought to be. And so th this is a, another one of those things that he says, don't suffer. If you're a believer, don't, don't view your suffering in the same light as the people who do these things. So when he begins to talk about this, he's saying that there is an expectation of suffering that accompanies these problematic behaviors and the reason that there's an expectation is because it's warranted. Whenever somebody ventures off into these misdeeds, when somebody ventures off into this kind of conduct, he says that there is a consequence that should be expected and that it should necessarily correspond to the deed that's been committed. The suffering comes through this unassuaged guilt and also from the just penalty that might be incurred through the laws of the land. Broken laws result in penalty. That's the way it should be, and that's the suffering that comes on the other side of these kinds of behaviors and conduct. And this might be a good time for us to take just a minute and talk about the Christian and the law of the land. Because we live in a day whenever uh, almost every law that's on the books is being challenged by somebody at some level, and, and it seems like that the louder the voice... The, the more the shouting is, that the more that people believe that, that noise makes right. And I want to tell you that whenever we understand that laws that are established for our land are established to govern us and to guide us, to protect us, and also to empower others to protect us, we need to understand that there's a place in God's economy that we fall into line in recognition of the rightful place of laws in our land. And just because we may see something that might at some point challenge that law or, or even stretch that law, that doesn't mean that the law itself is wrong or bad. What it means is that, is that, that the, maybe the, the, uh, the, the utilization of that law is, is something that's gotten out of hand with the per persons who might be utilizing it. So we need to understand that, that laws exist for us. They exist for the protection of society. They exist for the protection of people. And we need to find ourselves in line as, as Scripture leads us to understand the laws and to obey them uh, and, and to make sure that they're implemented with justice in a right way and in a right fashion. It seems to me that our world, and even, even in Christian circles right now, that if somebody doesn't like a certain behavior, that they will challenge every law that might result in, in some of the behavior that is going on out there. And, and so we need to come to a place where we find ourselves as believers recognizing the rightful place of law in our land and, and supporting those who implement it when they do so justly and fairly. And so that's just a, an aside there. That was free this morning, just a kind of a thing that's going on in our world today. But he's telling us here that there, there is an ex expected consequence of the breaking of these laws, the breaking of societal laws. And, and, and there's a consequence that results in necessary suffering. Sometimes that may result in imprisonment. Sometimes it may result in just the, the overall eating up with guilt that occurs in the lives of somebody. It may result in the pain that it in, inflicts on somebody else. But there's suffering that comes with these misdeeds, this poor conduct. And he says, what I want you to understand is that as a believer, you are not to view your suffering in the same light as those who suffer because of evil deeds committed. So he now says that even as those who have this, this expectation of a consequence of suffering for poor behavior, there also is an expected consequence of suffering for professed belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. We talked about last week how Peter said, don't think it's something that's strange. Don't think it's weird or unusual if you suffer for the Lord. Don't think that's something that, that is not expected or predicted. Scripture tells us over and over. Jesus himself said, if the world hates you, you understand that it hated me first. And so he says, don't, don't be surprised when that happens. It's an expected consequence of, of professed belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. But Unlike suffering that comes because of evil deeds, the one who suffers for Christ, he says, bears no shame in that suffering. Look at what he says, verse 16. If anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. So there's two, two results of that. The first, he says, is that, that unlike accompanying suffering for evil, the one who suffers for Christ has no reason to be ashamed when he finds himself suffering. 
And I want to tell you that, that, that there have been times whenever those who suffered for Christ have experienced some element of belief that it happened because of something they've done or, or somebody that they are, or some situation that they could have changed. But he says that whenever we suffer for Christ, rather than viewing it as an occasion to be ashamed because something like this has come in upon our life, he says instead glorify God in that circumstance and in that situation. In fact, as he, as he uses the words glorify God in this matter, that word matter is a word that has at its root word the idea of the, of the word name. So when he says glorify God in this matter, it's, it's as if he's saying glorify God in the name, the name Christian that has brought you to the place of suffering. And, and so he says glorify God that your suffering is happening because you're a Christian and not because of some evil deed that you've committed like others are experiencing. So he tells us here that there is this, this contrast in the causes of suffering. Some suffer because they've committed evil, but you might suffer because you confess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But then he begins to talk about the fact that there also is a contrast in conclusions for those who suffer. He begins by talking about the one who suffers for Christ. Look at what he says, verse 17. By the way, this is one of the most, I think, misunderstood and misinterpreted verses that we read in the Bible. It says, For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. Now, this is typically the place where the preacher starts screaming and shouting and telling everybody how evil they are and, and, and saying that God is judging His people. Well, let me tell you what this is really talking about. He's talking about this in the context of suffering because of who we are in Christ. And he wants us to understand something. That whenever suffering comes our way, for the one who suffers Christ as a Christian, the one who suffers for Christ because he's a Christian, the word judgment is used here. But look at what it says. It says, for the time has come. Now he's talking about when suffering arrives in your life, that this is the time. Now is the time, is what he's saying. When, when a, a judgment upon your life is being affected. Now, now, what do I mean by that? The word judgment, you need to understand, it, it doesn't always mean a pronouncement of some sort of a sentence or some sort of a declaration of something wrong or bad or harsh. It, all, it has the, the connotation of the idea of an evaluation. And whenever, the, whenever the, the suffering that we incur because of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ happens, he says what's happening is that's the time when the people who are the people of the house of God where their faith is being evaluated as in no other time in their experience. Now you think about this. You think about the times in your life whenever your faith has not been tested, when your faith has not been challenged, when your faith has is is, is really just kind of been an easygoing, ongoing thing that, that just kind of is merrily, merrily moving along the stream. No, no big deal. No, no hard things. No hard challenges. And you think about the times of suffering in your life. You think about the times when your faith has been put to the test. And I want to tell you that it's in those times whenever your faith is put to the test that the evaluation of your faith becomes more clear to you and to God than any other time in your life. And so when he says here that there's a judgment that's occurring, and he says that the, the time for this judgment, now is the time, the time of this suffering, during suffering, judgment begins in the house of God among believers. This is the test of your testimony as no other test. And during trials, believers are most seriously and severely tested more than at any other time, so that during those times, the true nature of our faith is revealed. The authenticity of our faith is revealed. The, the, the fact of it, the essence of it, the substance of it, the reality of it. Whenever you come to the place where there's nothing that you have in your life except God, and, 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 and He's all that you have to trust in and rely on, that's when you're going to see how strong your trust and your faith really and truly is. So in the midst of the trials, the first thing that happens is the true nature of your faith becomes clear. You see what your faith is made of. You see how strong your commitment to the Lord really is. The second thing that happens is that the nature of the gospel itself is affirmed. When testing comes upon your life, and, and, and you begin to realize that just because you're a Christian, you're not immune to suffering. 
You're not invulnerable to challenges and difficulty. Just because you're a believer doesn't, doesn't immunize you from the, the same kinds of, of struggles and challenges and, and, and difficulties and harsh conditions that the rest of the world faces. The nature of the gospel is affirmed. What is the nature of the gospel? Look at what he says here. I want you to pay very careful attention to this. Look at the very first part of verse 18. He says, Now if the righteous one is scarcely saved... If the righteous one is scarcely saved. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about that, that sentence, that phrase very much. But I want, you to li- I want you to consider the implications of that phrase. The righteous one is scarcely saved. What does that mean to us? What is that trying to communicate to us? What is that trying to say to us? It's communicating to us a fact that we need to come to terms with. And that is that salvation is a difficult proposition. It's it's easily obtained and experienced, but there's nothing easy about it. There's no such thing as an easy believism. There's no such thing as, as expecting eternal life as a gift for you just because you get your name on a church roll or you run through a baptistry. The fact is that that our salvation comes whenever we come to the end of ourselves, whenever we come to the place where we make our journey to the cross and we there lay down our lives and we die to ourselves. And as we die to ourselves, I want you to know that for Mike Lawson, there's nothing easy about that. I want to live to myself. We all have our self that, we want, that, that keeps trying to, to, to find its way back to the center part of our lives. And, and salvation is not an easy proposition. There's no such thing as an easy believism. And he says the righteous will scarcely be saved. This is really referring back to a, a, a situation whenever Jesus was talking about the rich young ruler who was not saved. And, and, and he, he made the statement, he said, uh, how, how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples asked this question, well, who then can be saved? And, and Jesus made this declaration. He said, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees, you'll by no means enter the kingdom of God. Now, I want to tell you, the Pharisees, they dotted every I and they crossed every T in living the law. So what was he saying? I want to tell you what he was saying. He was saying that you can't produce enough righteousness in and of yourself to enter the kingdom of God. You can't do it. There's no way that you can muster up or conjure up enough goodness in yourself to be good enough to enter the kingdom of God. It's not by righteousness that we've produced that we're able to be saved, but it's by His righteousness alone that's imputed to us from the cross, from the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ where He died. It is through His death, it is through His burial, it's through His resurrection, it's through His suffering that righteousness becomes something that's accessible to us and it's difficult for us because we want to to try to figure out how to make this salvation happen in our own terms. And there's so many people now that are coming to a place where they think that just because they say make a declaration about, about their, their willingness to pray for somebody else or, or, or the fact that they believe that, that God is out there, that that's enough. But I want to tell you that it's not. There has to be this journey to the dying place where self dies, where self is, is dead and Christ is enthroned and He lives in us from this point forward. Just outside of Madrid, there's a monastery called the Escorial. You may have heard of it. Many of the kings of Spain have been buried there for centuries, and there was an architect who built it, and when he built it, he, uh, he built the church there so low that it frightened the king. The king thought that it couldn't withstand structurally what was going to be coming. So fearing that it would collapse, he ordered the architect to add a column to uphold the middle of the arch. The architect protested. He said it's not necessary for that to happen, but the king insisted, and so the architect added the column. Years later, the king died. It was only then that the architect was courageous enough to reveal that the column was actually a quarter of an inch short of touching the arch and that the arch hadn't sagged in the least. The tour guides, they say, still pass a lath between the arch to prove that experience. But 
Donald, Donald Gray Barnhouse, in speaking about this reality, he said, the arch illustrates our salvation. He said, we think that there's something that we can do to bolster it or to support it or to add to it. But he said, what we need to understand is that our salvation is absolutely sufficient in the grace of God and in the grace of God alone. It's abs absolutely sufficient in the righteousness of God and in the righteousness of God alone. There's nothing that we can do to support it. There's nothing we can do to strengthen it. There's nothing we can do to manufacture it. There's nothing we can do to produce it. He has produced it. And whatever we bring to it is just simply a, a, a figure. It's a symbol of something that we think we're doing. I want to tell you something. Whenever our faith is tested, the nature of the gospel is affirmed, and it's affirmed as something that takes us sometimes down some difficult paths. So there's a contrast in conclusions for those who suffer. For the one who suffers for Christ, the true nature of faith is revealed. The nature of the gospel is affirmed. But then for those who suffer for misdeeds, and I want you to see this stark contrast here. The first thing that I, that I want to show you is that the atrocities of that heart are revealed when suffering comes. The fact is that that whenever suffering comes for professing believers and, and reveals the nature of their faith, so does suffering for evil. It acts, it brings evaluation to the hearts of those who commit them. And whenever you see someone who is, is, is caught up in wickedness and evil as a lifestyle and suffering begins to come, basically what that does is it reveals the presence of a heart that is wicked and evil as well. And the atrocities of that heart are revealed by the suffering that comes on account of the wickedness that they've performed. The second thing is this. The end of what I, what I call gospel scorn is implied here. Listen to these words again. He says, "...the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, then what will be the end of those who do not obey?" the gospel of God? That's a question. It's a rhetorical question. But the implication is that if we are scarcely saved and we're trying to do good, we're trying to live righteously, what about those who are not obeying the gospel of God? What do you think their end is going to be? And then it says again in verse 18, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, then where do you think the ungodly sinner will appear. And so the implication here is very simple. He's asking, what are the chances of those who are absolutely ungodly, those who absolutely refuse to repent, those who choose to never refrain from an evil life, those who choose to disobey or reject the gospel of God? He says there's no hope for them. The implication is there's no hope of expecting anything other than the full consequence of a just recompense of reward for that disobedience. That's the expectation. And so I want to say to you this morning, if you're here, or if you're listening beyond this place, I want you to, I want you to understand that it is only through obeying the gospel of God, it's only through coming to a place of personal repentance and, and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ because of His vicious, vicarious, victorious death and suffering on the cross that brings us any opportunity for forgiveness of our sin and imputed righteousness. Righteousness is a gift from God. We can't make that ourselves. We can't produce that ourselves. We can't come up with that on our own. It has to come from Him. And if you're counting on anything else, then I want you to know that you're living in a very precarious position where your life is in eternal danger. And the consequences of not obeying the gospel of God are eternal and they're deadly. Please, please, listen to Jesus. Trust Him. Follow the prompting of His Spirit. So, as we come to the end of these verses, this chapter, and really where Peter begins to kind of wrap up the idea of suffering as a Christian, suffering because you're a Christian. I think there's some things that we can take away from this that might help us. The first one is this, <clears throat> and this is, this is kind of the broad statement here. Any suffering that strengthens our anticipation of eternity with our Savior is invaluable to us. If, if I experience suffering because I'm a Christian, and that makes me anticipate my opportunity to spend eternity with my Jesus, then it's been, it's been very valuable to me. It's better to suffer now for following Jesus than it is to suffer forever for disobeying the gospel. 
And so he's encouraging believers that if it's the will of God for them to suffer because of their faith, to embrace that suffering and trust. And he says, then, as believers who know that suffering is a likely possibility, that not only do we realize that it's better to suffer now for following Jesus than to suffer forever for disobeying the gospel, but he also wants us to understand that because of that, we must choose to live a commitment to him. What kind of commitment? Let me tell you what kind of commitment. The commitment that we've got to choose to live for Him is a commitment the depth of which matches the grandeur of the gospel that tells us the story of the suffering of Jesus on our behalf. Scripture says that it is by His stripes that we are healed. That it is by His brokenness that we are made whole. That it is by His shed blood that we are made clean. And our commitment to Him must match the grandeur of the gospel story, and we must live that out. How do we do that? He tells us in verse 19, we endure suffering if it comes. Let those who suffer according to the will of God do this. Commit your soul to Him in doing good as to a faithful creator. We endure suffering as we entrust our very souls to God who is sovereign and benevolent And we demonstrate that trust through faithful living, which is our complete surrender to Him.